Hey, how's it going, everybody? My name is Tyler Matheny, and I am one of the informatics fellows with the RNA Bioscience Initiative here at the University of Colorado Anschutz. Uh, this year, we're trying a new format with our class where we dive into some of the theoretical underpinnings behind uh, the code that we are running in class. And we're going to try to uh, record these in pre-lecture videos so that you have some kind of intuition for some of the uh, statistical concepts that are underlying the code that we actually run in class. Uh, the topic for today's video is dimensionality reduction. And dimensionality reduction is simply where we take a high dimensional data set, such as single cell RNA-seq uh, data, and we're going to reduce it in a, into a lower dimensional space uh, by grouping many different variables into meta variables, if you will, uh, that are based on linear combinations of the different underlying variables, in this case, genes. Um, in many cases, we are going to collapse our high-dimensional single-cell RNA-seq data uh, down into two, a two-dimensional space so that we can visualize it on a simple XY Cartesian coordinate system. And for today's lecture, we're going to take a look at three commonly used dimensionality reduction techniques called principal components analysis, UMAP, and TSNI. And we're going to primarily focus on principal component analysis, as this is the most straightforward dimensionality reduction technique to understand conceptually. Uh, and many of the principles that we learned from looking at principal components analysis will give you an idea of what is going on under the hood of more complicated dimensionality reduction techniques, such as UMAP or TSNI. So to illustrate the concept of dimensionality reduction, I want to put biology aside for a second, and I want to talk a little bit about how YouTube recommends videos to its users. So let's take a second and pretend that we are the CEO of YouTube. So as the CEO of YouTube, you really have two primary goals. Your first goal is to, one, keep people engaging with your platform for as long as possible. And secondly, you want to monetize this engagement by selling advertising space on your website. In order to keep people engaging with your website, you want to recommend videos that are tailored to each user. And in order to make money, you want to send this user advertisements that they are likely to be interested in. YouTube achieves these goals by collecting data on how you interface with their platform. Every time that you click a video on YouTube, YouTube is recording all kinds of data on which video that you watched, how long you watched the video, whether or not you paused the video, if you rewatched the video, and if you liked or disliked the video. So just to demonstrate this, I pulled some of the analytics from a previous uh, video that I posted on YouTube. So here you can see the total uh, watch time uh, on this video, as well as the average uh, view duration. You get data like the number of likes versus the number of dislikes. And you also can get uh, uh, traces of how long viewers interface with the video. Since YouTube collects all of this data on viewer preferences, they need a way to analyze this data in order to make video recommendations. Therefore, they utilize a branch of artificial intelligence called machine learning. Machine learning involves the use of specialized algorithms to classify data using a variety of different approaches. And there are really two main classes of machine learning algorithms, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Supervised machine learning involves the use of training data in which there is a ground truth label for the data. For example, if I went to work for a bank, I might want to train a machine learning model that would be able to distinguish between customers who were in good standing with their loan or if they were in default. Good standing and default would be the two labels I would use to classify customers, and it would be supervised because I would already have labeled these data prior to building the model. And the end goal would be, find, would be to find certain attributes that would allow us to predict whether a future borrower would be likely to repay their loan or likely to default. Unsupervised machine learning, in contrast, is when 
we do not have ground truth labels for the training data. For example, we can return to our YouTube analogy. We do not know ahead of time how many different classes of users are using the website. We cannot label these data ahead of time because there is no way of knowing whether or not there are hundreds of different types of users or tens of thousands of different types of users using the website. Therefore, we need a way to group these users into clusters of users with similar viewing habits without knowing ahead of time how many different classes of users there are. Let's take a simple example of how YouTube might track your viewing habits. And obviously, this is going to be an embarrassingly gross simplification of what YouTube actually does. So each column in this table would represent a different user. And each row would indicate a different category of video that YouTube has. And the data here would represent the amount of time each user spent watching each of these different types of videos. Uh, and we'll just assume that this data is in hours as the units. So there are hundreds of millions of, user, of users on YouTube, if not billions. And there could be thousands or even tens of thousands of different categories of videos that they might track. So obviously, this is a ton of data. And we really need an effective way of collapsing this data down, aka reducing the dimensionality of this data set, in order to reveal meaningful patterns in this data. Our end goal would be to end up with a map that might look something like this. And obviously, this would be a subset of the total map, because this is obviously not as many users as would be on YouTube. From this map, data points that would be close together in space would represent users that have similar viewing habits, while data points that are far apart in space would represent users that had different viewing habits. Once we had a map like this, then we could try to cluster the data into distinct groups of users, as depicted by the different uh, coloring of these data points or users. And then finally, we could examine which uh, clusters of users liked which types of videos. So for example, these users might like comedy videos. And these users might like videos about the news. Since we moved from a data frame that had many different users and many different categories of videos and the watch duration for these videos, and we moved from this into a graph that looks like this, then these axes actually represent combinations of many underlying variables. But how do we get these combinations of these many underlying variables? Well, this brings us to the topic of dimensionality reduction. And as I stated before, there are really three main types of dimensionality reduction techniques that we commonly use in single-cell RNA-seq analysis. These are PCA, UMAP, and TSNE. And right now, I want to focus on principal components analysis, as this is the easiest to understand. Now, a lot of people make a big fuss whenever they first learn PCA, but as I will show you in the next few slides, this process is not that complicated. So let's go ahead and take a look at the theory and mathematics that underlie principal component analysis. First, let's just consider a small data set of six different YouTube viewers and the fraction of time that they spend watching political videos, and coronavirus uh, videos. We can plot this data out on a graph. Here, the x-axis represents the fraction of time that viewers spend watching political view videos, and the y-axis represents the fraction of time that viewers spend watching videos about coronavirus. So just by looking at the data, you can see that the two variables seem to be correlated in some way. Users who tend to watch a lot of political videos also tend to watch a lot of videos on coronavirus, 
while users who spent less time watching political videos also spent less time watching coronavirus videos. We might speculate that these two variables are related to a given user's interest in current events. To run principal component analysis, we will first need to project each data point onto the x-axis of our graph and take the average of these data points. So here we project them onto the x-axis and then the red X on the X axis represents the average value of these data points. Similarly, we will take each data point and project it onto the Y axis and take the average of all of these data points. Now we will take the average X and Y coordinate and plot this on our original graph. This point will serve as the center of our data. Now that we have calculated the center of our data, we are going to go ahead and abandon our original x and y axes and draw a new x and y axis, while still maintaining the relative position of all of our data points to the center. And now we are going to go ahead and shift our data until that center point lies at the origin of our axis. Finally, we are going to plot a line of best fit for this data. But how did we calculate this line of best fit? Well, to find the line of best fit, we can either try to minimize the length of these blue dashed lines, which represent the distance between each data point and its projected point on the line of best fit, or we can maximize the distance of these green lines shown here, which would be the distance between the projected uh, data point and the origin. This method is called sum of squares because we square each of the distances. And the reason that we square the distances is because that we will have positive distances and negative distances, and we don't want these values to cancel each other out, so we square them. To show that these methods of shortening the blue lines or maximizing the distance of the green dashed lines are equivalent, let's just consider one data point. As the line of best fit gets better and better, the blue line will get shorter and the green line will get longer. And at the line of best fit for this single data point, you can see that the blue line has uh, totally vanished and the green line is at its maximum distance. The reason that I bring up this point is that PCA actually works by maximizing the distance of these green dashed lines, which is the distance between the origin and our projected data point on the line of best fit. It just works out that the math is much simpler to calculate this distance rather than trying to calculate the distance between each individual data point and its projected data point on the line. Once we have drawn our line by maximizing the sum of squares distances, this will actually serve as principal component number one. To get principal component number two, we can simply draw a line that passes through the origin that is perpendicular to principal component number one. This is principal component number two. And now we can abandon our original x and y axis and we can rotate this graph until principal component 1 serves as the new x-axis and principal component 2 serves as the new y-axis. Hooray! We have now drawn our principal component graph. So let's just take one step back and remind ourselves where these PC1 and PC2 axes came from. These were originally determined by our line of best fit, shown here to the right. And to remind ourselves, the x-axis and the y-axis were the fraction of time watching political videos and the fraction of time watching coronavirus videos.
In this manner, we can think of PC1 and PC2 as linear combinations of these two variables. The slope of the line for principal component 1 can give us a recipe for how to make principal component 1. The slope here is 0.84, which means that we need to mix 0.84 parts of the coronavirus video viewing time with one part political video viewing time in order to recapitulate principal component 1. This tells us that political view video viewing time is slightly more important than uh, the coronavirus v video viewing time when making principal component 1. After some normalization that I'm not going to go through in detail through here, we end up with loading scores for principal component 1. In this case, political videos uh, loading score is 0.76 and coronavirus video's loading score is 0.64. Once again, once you work out the math, this is still directly proportional to the slope that we derived. By getting the loading scores for our principal components, we can figure out which variables are most important for determining that principal component. And when we tried this with our single cell RNA-seq data, this will tell us which genes play the most influence in determining the principal components that we derive. Now let's go ahead and figure out how to calculate the amount of variance that's explained by each principal component. For PC1, we need to first project the data onto the x-axis and then measure the distance of each projected data point to the origin. So for example, for this data point, we're going to project it onto the x-axis, and then we're going to measure the distance to the origin. We're going to do this for every data point, and then we're going to take the sum of squares of the distances to the origin and divide by our sample size minus 1. This equals the variation for principal component 1. For principal component 2, we're going to do a similar thing where we project each data point onto the y-axis and then measure its distance to the origin. And then we're going to calculate the sum of square of these distances divided by the sample size minus 1, and this will equal the variation for principal component 2. Then to calculate the variation explained by each principal component, we take the variation for principal component 1, and then we divide by the sum of the variation for principal component component 1 plus the variation of principal component 2. And then to calculate the variation explained by principal component 2, we'll take the variation of principal component 2 divided by the sum of the variation of principal component 1 and 2. When we do this for this plot, we find that principal component 1 accounts for 95% of the variation in this data, while principal component 2 accounts for only 5% of the variation in this data. Therefore, we could drop principal component 2 and still capture 95% of the variance on this data set. And thereby, we could reduce its dimensionality from two dimensions to one dimension. We often do this type of process when there are many principal components, not just two like in this example. For example, if we had 10 different principal components, more than likely, just a couple or a few of those would explain the majority of the variance in that data set. Often you will see the principal components and the amount of variation explained in a plot that looks like this. This is called a scree plot. And basically, what this does is take each principal component and then plots on the y-axis uh, the amount of variation explained by that principal component. Once we have run dimensionality reduction on our data, we generally pick 10 to 20 principal components that explain the majority of the variance in our data. We generally do this by looking at a scree plot and then determining uh, an inflection point where we start to get diminishing return for each principal component added. We can then further reduce the dimensionality using uh, more complicated algorithms such as UMAP or TSNE.
These are non-linear reductionality techniques that will help us to better cluster our data. But since these techniques are nonlinear, they are good at preserving the local structure of clusters within our graph, but the global structure is not preserved. And that's going to have some implications that we will dive into more in the second class of our workshop. But for right now, I just really want you all to take away um, uh, some understanding of the mathematics behind principal component analysis. Thanks for your attention, and I will see you all in class.